Right guys, so now we're going to look at the uh, practice questions for Vikings. Now the purpose of the uh, practice questions is that you're, you should pause the video, do the annotation, and then check your answers. So I'll read the question, then you pause it, annotate the question, jot down some ideas of what you would write, and then continue the video and see what I put. So the idea is to compare what you've put to what I've put, and then you can see whether you're on the right lines. If you want to write out any of these questions um, and then send them to your teachers, um, they'll be more than happy to mark them. So just send them on if uh, you want to write them as practice. Now, the summary, the current organised summary for Vikings is different to crime and punishment. It's different because you need to make sure that you're focusing on historical skills in your analysis. So your analysis for crime and punishment would be, you know, did, does a crime, why does a crime start or why does a crime end or why, why, why is there a change? But for Vikings, you need to focus on three historical skills. So you can use one of these historical skills in your analysis, either significance why is it significant? Why is it important? You've got diversity, which is how is it different? How does it change? How is it, how is it different across, um, say, for example, uh, diversity in different uh, locations in Sweden, in, in Denmark, in Norway? Uh, so that would be diversity. Or the other one is impact. What impact do the Vikings have? So be thinking when you're doing your analysis, um, am I talking about significance, am I talking about diversity, or am I talking about impact? Okay. As we go through these, what I'll do is when I plan them out, I'll be highlighting what my historical skill is for each one. So first question then, write a clear and organised summary that analyses Viking settlement in the British Isles after 865. Support your summary with examples. So pause the video now, have a go at annotating the question and jotting down ideas of what you would write for your three points. So if I'm analysing this question, if I'm uh, breaking it down, I look at clear and organised summary that analyses Viking settlement in the British Isles after 865. So this is what it's asking me to focus on. Viking settlement in the British Isles after 865. Okay. For a clear and organised summary, remember we're writing three paragraphs with a PDA structure, point develop, analyze. So the three points that I would probably talk about, uh, I would, first one, I would talk about the Dane law. The second point, I would talk about uh, the uh, assimilation into English life, or Saxon life, sorry. And then the third one, I'd probably talk about Jorvik. Okay. Now I want you to turn over the page and you'll see that we have a structure strip for the same question. So again, I want you now to pause the video, highlight the question, key parts of the question, and then I want you to plan out your point develop analysis for each question for each uh, paragraph. Remember that in your analysis, you need to be talking about historical skill. So either the impact that they had, the significance of them, or the, or the diversity of them, how they are different. Okay, pause the video.
Right, so I'm going to put my points in first. Dane law, assimilation, and Jorvik. And I'll start with Dane law. So I've said one aspect of that settlement would be the Dane law. Now in my development, I need to talk about the Dane law. I need to say what it is, maybe how it's created, knowledge and information around what the Dane law is. So I would talk about the Treaty of Wedmore in 878. I would talk about uh, it splitting England, north and east parts were the Dane law. I talk about it having uh, Viking laws and customs. Then the analysis. So I need to be thinking about my historical skill. The one that fits uh, most for this would be impact. So I talk about what the impact of the Dane law was. So I'll uh, highlight Talk about impact there. So my analysis for the Dane law is going to be the fact that um, England is controlled. Part half of England is controlled by the Vikings. fact it's split uh, into uh, burrs controlled by day uh, controlled by yarls I think as well the impact could be it lasts for 50 years it's a very long-standing uh, split in England and its impact is is it has a, it has a large impact and then you could link that to the laws, and the fact that people who live in this region of the Dane law are uh, subject to Danish laws and Danish customs. Next one would be assimilation. So again, in our development, you could talk about the idea of the invisible Vikings. You could talk about the fact that they uh, intermarry relatively quickly. They take on Saxon culture because in the Dane law both Saxons and Danes live there. The, the Saxons don't leave, the, Dane, the Saxons remain in the Dane law, they just live under Danish law. So we could talk about the, the fact that Saxons and Danes intermarry, that they lose their Saxon culture. <clears throat> they take on Christianity. So I'll just give you a minute to get that down. And then you could link the uh, invisible Vikings by talking about place names. And you can even talk about the uh, Hogback tomb. The Vikings use. Okay, so on to our analysis then. For the assimilation, we could talk about impact, we could talk about significance, or we could talk about uh, diversity. Again, I would talk about, um, oh, well, you could do multiple ones. Um, We'll do impact again, makes sense, because we can talk about the impact that assimilation has. So the impact is they lose their Viking identity. Relatively quickly. So. And that's, that, that's the impact that it has. 
but they lose their Viking identity relatively quickly. They blend in to English society or Saxon society, sorry. And they they become invisible Vikings, so you can even link that down to that. The final point is Jorvik. Now, Jorvik was a, a really significant and important part of the Dane law. So I think our analysis for this has to be significant. Why is why is Jorvik such a significant place? Okay. So if we're talking about Jorvik then, huge trading center. Across the world, um, it's a wealthy place. By the year one thousand, uh, there is ten thousand people living in Jorvik, which is really significant. And there are lots and lots of craftsmen working with bone, wood, um, ivory. Uh, and so on, glass, craftsmen and markets. In terms of understanding how, how we know all this information, you could also make reference to the Coppergate dig. And the fact that the Coppergate dig told us a lot about Jorvik's, Jorvik's sort of, um, life in Jorvik. So on the analysis, why is it significant? Well, Jorvik brings great wealth. to uh, the Dane law. They trade, their trade is, in, is international. And we know it's of great significance because they mint coins there. We know it's significant because they mint coins there. So its significance is that it's of great wealth. Its trade is international. Um, we know it's international because they find silver dirhams and other unusual items which aren't found in uh, England. And then the fact they're in their own coins as well. In your development, you could also add that it is the capital of the day and more. Okay. On to the next one then. I'll give you time now, pause the video, write a clear and organized summary that analyzes the trading activities of the Volga Vikings. Support your summary with examples. So pause the video, annotate your question and write your three points that you would talk about here. So again, a clear and organized summary that analyzes the trading activities of the Volga Vikings. So it's a clear and organized summary. So we know there's three PDA paragraphs and trading activities of the Volga Vikings is our focus. Trading activities of the Volga Vikings. So the three points that I would put here, one, two, and three. The first, the first point I would talk about would be the, the trade with Baghdad. I think that's really significant with the Arab world. Second must be Constantinople. Trade with the um, Byzantine Empire. And the third, I think we could talk about Novgorod and Kiev. The formation of them and why they're so significant, why they're so important. Because that is all to do with the trading activities of the Volga Vikings. 
Okay, so turn over. I want you to now analyze, um, highlight the uh, keywords in this question, and then pause the video. Fill in what you would write here, please. So the three points that we are talking about are firstly Baghdad, trade with Baghdad, second trade with Constantinople, and thirdly the importance of Novgorod and Kiev. So our analysis here for ba let's start with Baghdad. Okay, we're going to be talking about the trade and the trading activities with Baghdad. So with our development, we know that in Baghdad, the most valuable commodity that they wanted was the silver dirhams. Both traded items they could not have or they could not find in their own lands. So the last point is the formation of Novgorod and Kiev and how they act uh, as, as important places for training activities for the Volga Vikings. So we'd say that Novgorod was founded by Rurik in 860. Kiev was founded by Oleg, his son. Do you remember their, their sons? And that's founded in the... Uh, 880s and that brings two villages together over the river Dnieper these uh, in both Novgorod and Kiev are uh, large trading towns And then we move on to our analysis and we're thinking about what are, how we're analyzing the trading activities. So again, we think about is it significance, is it impact, or could it be diversity? I think we talk about uh, the significance on this one. So we talk about significance here. And we want to talk about how they are significant. And Novgorod and Kiev are significant because it gives the Volga Vikings control of the river. So they control one of the main routes south, to, particularly towards Constantinople. And these towns grow very rich from traders passing through. So the significance is that they are, become powerful rich trading towns, Novgorod and Kiev, because they control sort of like the top and bottom of the river between the two. So they control the top and bottom of the river uh, Dnieper. So that would be the significance in the analysis. The final one that we're going to do is we're going to look at, write a clear and organized summary that analyzes everyday life in the Viking homelands. Support your summary with examples. So what I want you to do is I want you to highlight the key points, pause the video here, highlight the key elements of this question, and then put down three ideas of what you might write. So our key points here is a clear and organized summary, and it's to analyze everyday life in the Viking homelands, right? So I'm looking at that question here. I know that I can only talk about the homelands, and I'm talking about everyday life. So, so there's three of the things that I would talk about. There's lots you could talk about. You could do art, you could do runestones, tools, housing, food, ships. I think the three that I would talk about are 
um, housing, food, and ships. Okay. So I want you to turn over the page now again. And I want you to pause the video. And I want you to annotate your question and then plot what your point, your development, and your analysis would be for your three points. The three points that I talked about were housing, food, and ships. Okay, so we've got housing, food, and ships. Remember, as we go through these, we need to be thinking about our analysis. Are we going to talk about impact, significance, or diversity? Let's start with housing. Well, we know that housing, they lived in long houses, which were rectangular, with a half in the center. The, they kept animals in in the winter because of the weather, very hostile climate, particularly in Norway uh, and Sweden. It was one big room. All of the family lived there. So all the family lived in one room. You also say they had a thatched roof for the smoke to escape. So we've got all our information there. Now we talk about our analysis. Housing, the obvious one for analysis for uh, the analysis of housing is their, their significance because they are see, they are hugely significant in the fact that they are crucial for survival. They're key to the Vikings surviving in their uh, homeland because of the hostile climate. So because of the hostile climate, particularly in Norway and Sweden, they're crucial for survival. They're crucial not only for the survival of the, the Vikings themselves, but also for their animals as well, because their animals are a key source of food, so it's crucial for their survival. So I'll highlight significance. Um, as, our, as the uh, historical point there in the analysis. The next one we could talk about is food. So again, we discussed the food. Vikings, they, they, they ate seafood uh, if they were coastal. So for instance, in, in the coast of Norway, in the fjords, they hunted, particularly in Sweden in the forests, but they might grow food uh, or fish in Denmark. We know because they're only maximum 35 miles from the sea at any point. So this is a perfect point, this is a perfect um, point to talk about diversity because the food that they eat in each different region is different based upon where they are, based upon what's available. You can't fish if you live in the center of uh, Sweden if there's no lakes nearby, but there is lots of forests, so you would hunt. And the same with Norway, you would hunt in, in near the forests, but you would fish in the coastal areas. And the most common fish was the herring. And some of the meats that they would eat, they would eat elk, deer, and so on. So the analysis then is diversity. The fact that the food is different dependent on where they live. And that's what we that's what we'd say here. The food they eat the food they ate varied based upon their location. 
and then you could talk about uh, forests in Sweden and they, them being um, adaptable and sort of using the uh, environment that surrounds them. So forests, fjords, or um, sort of slightly more arable growing land in Denmark. Fertile land. So that's the point about diversity. The food they ate varied based upon their location. Finally, we've got ships. Now we know that ships were key to Vikings for fishing, for trading, for raiding. So again, that this point is significant. Ships were also a status symbol. So that we could talk about that as well. So development. We talk about the Vikings. They had different types of ships. They had different types of ships. They had the Nar. They had the fairing ship. They had the long ship. And these are all ships which are designed for completely different purposes. So they're, they're key for the Viking survival. And, and so on. So we'd say they're used for raiding, they're used for trading, and for fishing. Specifically, the NAR is for trading, the fairing ship is for fishing, and the long ship is for raiding. You could actually even talk about diversity at this point, and you could say, yeah, you know, your analysis could be diversity in the fact they have different ships for different purposes. But I think the significance is the fact that it allows them to, to live and, and to survive and to raid and to trade, which is a key part of their culture. So we'd say significance is a key part of their culture. To raid and trade. They're key for survival because of fishing and they adapt based upon purpose. So they're based upon the purpose of the vessel. Okay, so that's our clear and organized summaries. Practice for the Vikings done.